So today, quickly, we'll be going into the Word. I want to share on this powerful topic that I received in my heart. This is the Easter Sunday. The grave is empty. Tell your neighbor, the grave is empty. With all due respect to other faith, you will always, if you go to the grave of their founders or their, their set man, you will likely see bones there. But I know of a grave where you can't find any bone. There is no flesh, there is no bone. The grave is what? is empty. So I'll be talking on the power of his resurrection. The power of his resurrection. But before, I would love to do uh, an introduction on the foundational pillars of our faith. The foundational pillars of our faith. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 17 and verse 28. Acts chapter 17 and verse 28. It says, For him, for in him we live and move and have our being. That's the part I just want. For him we live, we move, and have what? Our being. Let's also look at Acts chapter 1 and verse 1. Let's not be lazy to turn our Bibles. Acts chapter 1 and verse 1. Foundational pillars or truth of our faith. You know, one thing I want us to understand, just keep that scripture there, is that we as believers or we as Christians, we must be, we must come to a point where we are grounded with the foundational knowledge of our faith. There are certain things that makes us to be called a Christian. A Christian is not practically a title. Yes, you can be called a Christian, but a Christian is beyond a title. I believe that's the best way to put it. Being called a believer or being called a Christian is beyond just a tag that you are knowing. You know, you want to fill a form. They say your religion, the list, and you go to look for Christianity. It's beyond a form or a tag you feel when you're filling a form. There are certain things that we must be indoctrinated by and when we have this knowledge rightly put together and given to us and we believe them then you can be called what a christian that's what i call foundational truth look at it was said that the book of Acts was written by the disciples luke and he was about to write an account for a man called theophilus and he said the former account i made meaning that luke has written the book of luke remember they have the four synoptic gospel mark Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So it was believed that Luke wanted to write this book for a man called Theophilus. So he said, after I've written the book of Luke, now this is the book of Acts. The former account, which is the book of Luke, O Theophilus, of all. Somebody say all. Okay, in Africa, it's not only the person with the mic that preaches. It's both of us that preach. Somebody say all. all. Say all. all. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all. Emphasis is all that Jesus began to do. Somebody said to do and to teach. So he said that in this book of Luke was, or in the whole book of the, 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 the accounts of Jesus, was written the things that he did and the things that he taught. So as believers, we understand that our lives must be in two dimensions now. The things that you what? Do and the things that you what? Teach. So a believer that only emphasizes on the things he teaches and not the things he does or the things that he teaches is contrary to the things that he does, then we must check whether that person is truly to be qualified as a Christian or not. Are we together? So he said, Jesus, our perfect example of all he began to do and to teach. And look at the arrangement of the words. He didn't say the things he teach, then do. He said what? Do and what? Teach. So when we talk of the gospel, or when we say preaching the gospel, what we are saying is the gospel is everything that Jesus did and what? Taught. The gospel, or the the foundational truth of Christianity, is everything, all, that Jesus did and teach. If you forget everything I say today, this should not leave your mind. So keep it at the front of your mind not that you say keep it at the back of him no i don't like the back keep it at the front of your mind everything about the gospel is all that jesus do and teach so when we say go and share the gospel what are we saying go and share the things that jesus did and what teach or taught thank you man <laughs> praise master jesus back to my slide so 
Like I said, the foundational truth are everything that is what makes the believer a Christian. What makes the believer believers? These are the things that must be believed, must be known by every Christian. You must know these things. That when you are called upon or asked at any instance, what makes you a Christian? You must have one, two, three, four. Because I'll be listing four things that makes us believers. Four things we must believe. Irrespective of our denomination. Irrespective of where we came from. Like we in this place now, we are a combination of different ethnicities. Different continents practically. What The, the Christian in Malaysia and the Christian in US, they, they must believe the same thing to be called a Christian. A Christian in Nigeria should come here and still feel among God's people because what makes them a Christian in Nigeria should be the same. 2 plus 2 in Malaysia is what? 2 plus 2 in Nigeria is also 4. Why didn't Malaysia change 2 plus 2 to be 6? Because there is a formula that was used in Nigeria and the formula is universal. Somebody say universal. universal. The formula is the same everywhere. So the things that you believe to be a Christian in another country must be the same you believe to be a Christian here. That's what we are saying practically. So this will not cause any divide irrespective of the, the denomination will come from. Irrespective of the ethnicity. That's why God says the gospel should be preached to every tongue, tribe, kindred, nations. Everywhere the gospel. So the gospel must be the same that we are preaching everywhere. Why then do we have divisions? Oh, this believe this, this believe that. There can be difference in the doctrine of the church. But in the foundational truth of this thing called the Bible, is clear. I wonder why we confuse many things when it's clearly written. So it's, it's maybe either we don't understand English or we don't know how to interpret English. Because it's written clearly. The formula for receiving Christ, the formula for being a Christian was clearly written in the Bible. So we're going to look at, because of time I will rush because... When it comes to this, it can take three hours to only dissect this. But go back to the found. There's something I want to pick now. Now, the truth, I said, is like a knife. It's like a knife. A knife is not a bad object. But though it can, it can what? Cause harm to you. So the knife becomes harmful only when it's handled, mis uh, uh, when it's, when it's handled wrongly or improperly. So that's how the truth is. See, do you know that half-truth or wrongly interpreted truth is more worse than a lie. It's better we know that something is a lie and is a lie. But when it's not the tr when the truth is twisted in a way, in a way and in a manner, it becomes harmful to us. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 6 to 11, and 1 Corinthians 2, 2. If you can quickly turn there, Paul was saying that I am a wise master builder. So Paul was talking to us as a builder. He said, This thing is about every person that God has given the grace to go and teach the gospel is a wise master builder because what you are doing is you are building the life of people that's why they, they said the school is the place where futures are formed is a place where futures are made because whatever it is whatever is taught in school will affect the, the destiny of a child so also when we come to the house of God we are taught the word of God and if you are given the privilege of preaching or teaching the word of God, which every one of us have been given that assignment in great, the Great Commission, we must be like what? A wise master builder. See, it says, I planted, Paul speaking, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Verse 7. Verse 7. So, so then, neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Quickly, verse 8. Now, he who plants and he who waters are what? Are one. There are some of us, it's not every one of us that may hold the mic per se, but every one of us have an assignment to ensure that the gospel is, 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 is spread abroad. For example, pastor preaches, I do social media. Everybody is partaking. It, it, it takes his time to prepare the word and come to teach God's people. I take the word, digitalize it and spread it out. So everybody, that's what this place is trying to say. Go to the next verse. But we receive our own reward. For we are God's fellow workers. We are what? God's fellow workers. Are we together? Amen. You are God's field and you are God's what? Building. Next verse. According to the grace of God which is given to me as a what? Wise master builder. I have laid the foundation. And another build upon it. Let each one take heed how he builds upon it. The last verse, 11. For no other foundation, this is the emphasis now. For no other foundation can anyone lay 
than that which is laid, which is what? Christ Jesus. Paul did not leave us in confusion what the foundation for every person is. Because in verse 10, Paul calls us a building. And you can't have this structure we have without a what? A foundation. And Paul is saying in verse 11, verse 11, he says that, verse 11, sir, he says, for no other foundation, don't entertain any other foundation should be laid, which, the, apart from the one which is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. And in 1 Corinthians 2, 2, he said that I decide to know nothing except Christ and him crucified. That will introduce me into our topic proper for today. He says the foundation that I want each and every one of us to have is the foundation of Christ. He said, for I determine, I, it's a deliberate determination not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So Jesus was crucified. And this is the foundation we must have as believers. Hallelujah. If this is your foundation, then you are secured. If this is not your foundation, then we have another opportunity today to repair your foundation. Because I tell you for free that if the foundation of a house is faulty, no matter how beautiful and nice the structure and the interior is, it will still collapse. True or false? True or true? No matter how, how beautiful you want to, you can paint the wall with gold. If the foundation is faulty, there is no how that house will not collapse. It's just what? A matter of time. So time proves the strength of your foundation. Can you preach to your neighbor? Say time, time. proves the strength, the strength of your foundation. Then ask your neighbor, is your foundation strong? Is your foundation solid? You must be able to know that your foundation is important. And Paul said, your foundation is Jesus Christ and him crucified. Hebrews 12, he says that Jesus is the author and the finisher. He begins your Christian work and he ends your Christian work. Praise Master Jesus. That's why we we started with Acts 17, 28. It says, in him I live, in him I move and have my full being. My everything is in Christ Jesus. My life is hidden in Christ. Everything I am, everything I am now, everything I will be is in Christ Jesus. That is the confidence some people have that they know that their future is secured. You know, some, there's, this, there's this song. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he owes my future. My life is what I live in just because he Listen to the lyrics of that song. It's, it's not just a song. It's an assurance that because Jesus lives, I can face tomorrow. Because of the resurrection, I know I have a guarantee for tomorrow. I have no fear for tomorrow. You can ask, what with your, you know, they usually ask, this, what's your five-year plan? What's your 10 years plan? I have no fear for the next 10, 20, 30 years because Jesus lives. That is the emphasis. That is the glorious gospel that we came to preach. That because Jesus lives, no matter what your tomorrow is, you can be sure. Just like the disciples with Jesus on the sea, they were traveling to the land of, um, is it the gatherings or so? The Bible says there was a great storm and Jesus was sleeping on the boat. It would have been simple. I would have gone. To what, what, whatever Jesus was doing was what I must do. He was sleeping, I would sleep. If we want to die, we die together. Simple as that. But the disciples were worried. They were shaking. Why Jesus was sleeping? If you read the book of the account of Mark, the Bible says that the water had filled the boat. The Bible says the water had filled... If, if water is entering the boat, it starts from the bottom, right? And it fills... The Bible says the water had filled... And Jesus was... The Bible says he was sleeping inside the chambers of the boat. So I don't understand. The water had filled Jesus and he was... Th- what kind of sleep is that? What kind of sleep would Jesus be sleeping? Water filled the boat and he didn't, he didn't trouble... They had, the Bible says they came and they smote him. Smote him means they spanked him to wake up. The extent of the peace and the rest Jesus had in the midst of the sea. Not by the bank of the river. The midst of the sea. If Jesus has that dexterity to be able to sleep in the midst of the sea, come on. That's a good partner to have in the journey of life. Jesus is the most only trusted partner to have in the journey of life. Praise Master Jesus. Next slide. Sorry, I promise not to treat this like my PhD defense. 
God. <laughs> next slide, next slide. Uh, okay, now, quickly, the foundational truth that establishes the gospel and you as a believer. What establishes you? Sorry if it is too small. What establishes you as a believer? What are the truths that you must hold and believe to make you a believer? Number one, the humanity of God. Quickly turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 for me. Thank you, sir. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 16. It says, For this is the great mystery of godliness. 1 Timothy 3, 16. The Bible says here, it says, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. What's that mystery? Yes, it says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. That's my emphasis. Because of time, we'll leave the rest. It says, God was, another translation says, God became flesh. God became man. Now, one of the things that you must believe as a Christian, that makes you a Christian, that must makes you strong as a Christian, you must believe the, the becoming of God in, to become a man or let me put it like this that you must believe that God became man in the person of Jesus it's, there are some things we call it non-negotiable this is non-negotiable God became God is not man God became man it's two different things if God is man then we talk about the ability for him to fall like man to, to, be, to, be, to be double ways like man to be confused like man to be weak like man but God became man. And there are reasons, back to my slide, there are reasons why God became man. And this is just for us to understand. No, 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 back. To be a man, you must fulfill this requirement. You must be a spirit, a spirit that must be hosted in a body and has a soul that links the body and the spirit together. So three things in you that makes you a man, your spirit, your soul, and your body. So God became what he created for us. Because there is a, there is a reason why. There, in, the, in, in the beginning, there was a law of God called the law of death. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death. And spirits don't die. Spirits can only be separated. But spirits don't die. It says, For the wages of sin is death. This death could only be possible when you are a man. And now, because the Bible says, For all have what? Sin. David said in Psalms, he said, in sin did my mother what conceived us. This word is, is, is everywhere you turn to sin is left, right, center. We are all full of sin. All have sinned. And the punishment, the law was that the wages of sin, not might be, is death. So all of us were supposed to be sentenced to death. We were sentenced to death, not even supposed. We were all sentenced to death. And by the way, John 3, 16 now says, For God so loved the world that he didn't want to see the beauty of his creation that he loved so much, be sentenced to just death. What God had to do, the Bible says, he had to become the man. Because it, I, I, we may have, Mr. Richard was, is, a, was, is a lawyer, was, was a lawyer, and he could understand some terms in these things. That the person that, for example, if a man sinned, a spirit cannot pay the price because it's not it's not of the it's, it's not of the same it's not of the same natural habitat if 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 a dog sin you cannot punish a man for the dog so in the laws of god if a spirit if if, if spirit is responsible for it for a for a for a situation is the spirit that must be responsible for the solution and if a man was responsible for the, the mistake, because the Bible says sin came this come into this world through a man, through Adam. So it must be a man that must come to redeem that man back. That's why Jesus had to become a man. For God so loved the world, John 3, 16, that he gave his only begotten son to become what he created to come and die for us. Next slide, please. Why did God become a man? Jesus came as a man to be a representation of who God is. In the Old Testament, there is a mix, mis, um, mis ideology of what God is. Some people thought God was this, God was this being. God was, in fact, in Egypt, there were, there were different kinds of gods. For everything that happened to them, they created a God for it. 
So there was the God of fertility. There was the God of this. There was the God of thunder. There's God. Even in Africa, we had and we have thousands, billions of God in the world. But Jesus came as a true representation of who God is. That when you look at Him, you can be able to know, understand who God is. If you can look at that scripture, the slides will be sent to the group later. Number two, Jesus came to create a model for us as a perfect man. Jesus was our perfect example. Hebrews 12 verse 2 says, looking, you don't have to turn there because of time. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finish of our faith. Look unto him. Every man is possible for mistakes. No matter how perfect a man is, he can make mistakes. He says, woe is a man that puts it, no, woe is anybody that puts his trust on a man. If you put your trust on a man, be ready for constant dose of disappointment. Are we together? God came as Jesus to, for us to look unto him as the perfect example. And lastly, to put the sin of man on himself. Jesus came to take your sin. I wish I can, Mr. Anthony, I wish I can have a cup, two cup, one with water, one without water. Yes, sir. So Jesus, I want to show you an illustration. Jesus came to put the sin of man on himself. The Bible says when Jesus was in the, the garden of Gethsemane, the Bible says, and Jesus prayed, he said, Lord, if need be, let this cup pass over me. Because at the, the first time in Jesus' life, he was about to understand what sin looks like. How God looks at sin. The Bible says God cannot behold sin. So now Jesus was coming to pay for the sin of every one of us. So there is something Jesus did. Thank you, there is, there is something, there was something Jesus did. Are we together? Now look at this. Jesus went to Mr. Aaron. He poured, no, no, you can sit down. Jesus went to Mr. Aaron. He poured his sin into this cup. Went to Pastor David, poured his sin into this cup. Went to each and every one of us and went to everyone in the whole world. Poured their sin into the cup and came to meet Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Bible says what? He poured the cup. He gave Jesus the cup. All our sin. Jesus took, God took all the, our sins, put it in the cup and gave, poured this on Jesus' cup. And told Jesus to drink it. Jesus took the sin of every plus the one that is born and the one that has not yet been born. Jesus took the sin of the old world. God took it, put it in the cup, and took Jesus to drink it. One man. One man. Because Jesus was man does not mean that he didn't feel pain. He ate food. Jesus went to the toilet. So, in case you think Jesus, he went to Jesus. I'm, I'm sure Jesus may have eaten Nasi Lemak and all those things. So Jesus took the sin of everyone. God took the sin of everyone, poured it into the cup and asked him to drink it. Your sins, the sin you commit today, the one you will commit tomorrow, the one you will commit next three years, he took everything. Because Jesus is ageless. So the sacrifice Jesus did was for age eternity. One of us will be here in the next 60 years, 70 years. You may still sin. All that sin, he took it and gave it to Jesus to drink. And the Bible says, Jesus prayed and says, let this cup pass over me. Because he understood if he drinks that cup, God will not be able to behold him anymore. Because now, God does not behold. The Bible says, God does not behold iniquity. He doesn't behold sin. But yet, Jesus, because John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world. Because he loved us. That love was stronger than the sin. God told me something one time when I was facing guilt. He said to me, he said, the love I have for you is stronger than the sin that is trying to take you away from me. So the love God has for us is stronger. He put the sin of man on himself and Jesus took it to the cross to pay the judgment that was given in Romans 6.23. The wages of sin is death. Sin, anywhere there is sin, death must occur. Next slide, please, quickly. Number two, what is the truth you must believe? Number one, you must believe that Jesus became man. Jesus did what? Became man. The humanity of Jesus. He came. He came as man. He came. You, many of us may think it's easy. Jesus became man. So we are man. In the, in the level of God, that is the, is one of the hard. You know, it's to strip yourself of your glory. Somebody explained it like this for me. If you have a, a hole, a big earthquake happened and a hole is here. Are we together? A hole is in this place. And you see an ant walking. And you're looking at the ant. Small ant. 
the ant is walking, the ant can't see the hole. If the ant gets there, it's going to fall inside that hole. How do you tell the ant to go back or stop? If you try to use your hand, you can kill it. If you blow it, you can kill it. So what do you do? The, 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 the person explains, he says, imagine you becoming an ant just to quickly tear the ant or direct the ant away from that hole. That's what God did. Because who we are and what God, what God is, is you, don't, you can't compare yourself to the almightiness of God. Have you, have you taken your time to study the word and see how if in the, the most intelligent of a man cannot form the word in the way it is? Praise Master Jesus. So, God became what he created so that he can save us to himself. And he remained what he created. Jesus is not in heaven as a spirit. He's in heaven as a man. Because he didn't deserve, He ascended with that body he rose up with. So he became man so that he can intercede for you and I. Why did he remain as a man? The Bible says we don't serve an high priest who is interceding for us, who is not touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Meaning that whatever pain and struggle you are going through, Jesus understands because why? He's a man. He remained that way so that when you say, God, I'm struggling, Jesus can tell God that I understand what he's saying. We have to help him. That's why he remained as a man. What kind of love it is to remain with what you created. So he's becoming an ant and deciding to remain an ant just to make sure that other hand does not fall into it. A great love that God gave to us. Number two, the death of Jesus. As you believe the birth of Jesus, the humanity of Jesus, you must believe that Jesus died. Hallelujah. You must believe he died. What's the significance of his death? Because of his death, he had the legal right to go to hell. Because every soul that dies will go to hell. That every soul in sin that dies will go to hell. Are we together? It's in scripture. Any soul that sins will go to hell. Number two, his death was the highest revelation of God's love to us. The highest revelation of your love is in death. That's why the Bible tells, you know, when, when, the, when we are dragging in, 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 our little, in our little study of marriage, when we are, I don't understand why we drag uh, husband, and wife. they say the husband, wife, he must do. The wife, you know, when, when, when that argument comes of what the wife to do, what the husband to do, if we should follow scripture, God gave man the highest rule to play. He only told the woman submit, but he told the man love as Christ loves the church and gave his life for it. So, for everyone that wants to get married, my brothers that are single, <laughs> know that what God is saying is that you must. As you are getting married, means you are saying that this one, I will die for her. <laughs> so, Jesus, Jesus' death was a high revelation of the love of God. The highest that Jesus had to die on the cross. Jesus had to die for us. <laughs> John, you can see that in John 15 verse 13. The highest revelation of God's love was his death. He died. He didn't sleep. He died. He truly died for us. And lastly, the penalty of sin was paid. Forgive, forget the whole English. The penalty of sin, the wages of sin was paid when he died. And what happened? When he died, he went to hell to collect the keys of life and death from the devil. The powers that the devil had over you, Jesus went to get it from Satan. He went there. Romans, just check Romans 5 and verse 8. Romans 5 and verse 8, sir. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. It says, For yes, but God demonstrated his own love to us in, in that while we were still sinners. You see this point here? That Jesus did not wait. It was a risk Jesus was taking. Jesus never had any assurance that we would accept him. So he died. You know, it's like paying up front. I want to buy something from, from, from someone and I pay up front. What's the proof that the person will truly deliver that product? What if the person does not deliver? What else? It's a waste. The person can run with the money. But Jesus paid in advance and had faith that we would come to the knowledge of his love and give our lives for him or receive his life into us. He says, but God demonstrated his love to us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait to say, okay, let me see if they will change. If they will change, then I will go and die so that I'm sure that my, my death is not in vain. 
that love took that risk for you and I. But God demonstrated his love that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. Praise the Lord. Number three, second to the last one. The first one is what? The humanity of Christ. That God became man. The second one is the death of Jesus. These are what makes us Christian. These are what we believe, irrespective of our denomination. We believe Jesus came. We believe he died. Number three, we believe he was buried. The burial, I said, the significance of his burial is what? Is a proof that he truly died. You don't bury somebody that has not yet died properly. So they buried him to show that he truly died. And the burial was the ground that allowed the resurrection power to come. Because if he was not buried, there was no point of a resurrection. So we are looking at the power of his resurrection. The power of his resurrection came because Jesus was buried. Hallelujah. Let's look at the fourth one because of time. Number four, you must believe his resurrection, his ascension, and his exaltation. Say it together. His resurrection, his ascension, and his exaltation. These are, what we be, these are the four things you believe as a believer, as a Christian. That Jesus came into this world as a man. Jesus became a man. Jesus died on the cross. Jesus was buried in the grave. And Jesus resurrected. That's why we're all gathered here as Christians. That's why we're all celebrating Easter. That the grave is empty. Because he resurrected. He said, I would, I would, you will not see me for three days. Because I will die and on the third day I will resurrect it. And true to his word, the Bible testified that on the third day the angels came, rolled away the stone and sat on it to see who will come and roll it back. You know, the angels sat on it so to be that no, nobody can dare roll, roll the stone back into the grave. And Jesus is alive. So if you go to the grave, Jesus was buried. I bet you no matter how deep you dig, no matter how deep you dig, you will not find any bones because Jesus is alive. And that word, Emmanuel, can be real to us. That God is with me. Because why? Jesus is alive. This is the assurance you have for your future. That Jesus is alive. And the one that is risen has said that I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never leave you disappointed. That any time you call upon God, the reason he answers is because he's alive. Tell your neighbor he's alive. He's alive. You're not saying it like you believe it. Tell your neighbor he's alive. Give your neighbor a push. Say he's alive. he's alive. The reason Jesus, the significance of his resurrection is that he paid for the atonement. He, he resurrected and went to the high place in heaven, the altar in heaven, and put his blood there. That any time we fall short of sin, of the glory of God, when we say, Lord, have mercy, God can take his blood and wash us clean. You remember in the Old Testament, every year you come and sacrifice a one is it one one year one day old lamp for the remission of the sins of the people every year now imagine we have to keep doing that by now the, the people that don't have enough money would have been condemned so you see the power of the sacrifice of jesus but jesus because he's ageless jesus is he is he doesn't have a a, a date of he has he doesn't have uh an an, an uh, a death date because he resurrected and he's ageless means that the sacrifice of Jesus is what? Ageless. That's why tomorrow I can say, Lord, have mercy and there will still be blood to be able to wash me clean. Because why? Jesus is alive now and forevermore. And there is, he, do you know, he ascended to heaven and sat at the right hand of God. Means there is nothing on earth that can ever kill him. So we cannot be afraid and say, Aye, the Jesus that will save us or forgive our sins, if they catch him and shoot him now, <laughs> he's dead. We cannot have that fear because he went to the right hand of God. So, except you can go ascend to the right hand of God with your gun, and you can, you can, no way, no, it's not possible. So, our assurance is that he, he did not only resurrect, he ascended to heaven and he was exalted. And Jesus, God said, All powers in heaven, on earth, and beneath the earth has been given to Jesus. All powers. Somebody say, All powers. All powers. Not some, not half. All. All means what? All. All powers has been given to him. So the power of his resurrection is that what is is that the fact that as all powers are given to Jesus, Jesus came and took all the powers and gave it to you and I. Hallelujah. Jesus took that same power 
and gave it to you and I. That's why the Bible says in Romans, it says we are more than conquerors. So the reason I can tell a demon, get out, and he obeys me, is not because I did anything. No, it's because I have faith in the one that did everything. This is where we must, we don't, we don't, we don't see our, ourselves by self-righteousness. Because even the, in quotes, the most holy man of God or the most holy bishop is saved by the same blood you and I were saved with. God didn't use a special blood and save this one and use another. No. It's not different Holy Spirit in them. The same. All powers. Given to the pastor, given to the members. All powers. When we say everybody should pray for one another because it's the same power at work in the pastor that's at work in you and I. So the job of the man of God is to make sure that your eyes see the power that God has placed in the inside of you. All powers. The Bible says we are more than conqueror. What that means is that Jesus went to the boxing ring, fought the match, won the match, and gave you the belt. That's what makes you more than conqueror. It makes you more than, more than conqueror. He fought the fight, won the fight, and gave you the trophy. So when you use his name, what you are saying is, by reason of the fight and the victory Jesus had, I am liberated. Look at the next, next slide. It's very important here now. There's what we call the mystery of identification and the mystery of oneness. If Jesus did everything and won the victory, where is now my place in this? How am I now included in this? In Romans chapter 11 and verse 11. Can, we, can you turn there for me? Romans, or Romans 11 and verse 11. I said then, have, ye, have, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, we were the Gentiles, and because of the mystery of oneness and identification, we became one with Christ. What it means is that, you know, there is this thing in agriculture, they said engraftment, where you can cut a, a tree from here, a, a, a tree, a stem from here, and another one from here, and join them together, and they can grow to become one. Engraftment. That's what happened in marriage. Two different persons comes together. One, one plus one in our mass is two. But in God's mass, one plus one is one. In, in marriage, one plus one becomes one. Is that why I say two shall become one? How possible is that? The mystery of oneness. So that's what happened with us and Christ. That when Christ was dying on the cross, Galatians 2.20, when Christ was dying on the cross, I was in Christ. Meaning that God took us, each and every one of us, and put in Christ. He says, I have, Paul was speaking, I have been crucified with Christ. Was Paul there when Jesus was dying? No. But Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I, but Christ that lives in me. Paul was interchanging I and Christ together. Because why? Him and Christ has become one. How do we become one? When we believe in him. When we decide to accept that Jesus came into this world, died for me, was buried, and was resurrected. When you believe this thing in your heart and you confess with your mouth, Romans 10 verse 9 and 10. You believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, the power of resurrection comes into play. It makes you and Christ become one. So everything Christ did, you did it. Everything Jesus have, you have it. Everything Jesus, nothing, anything that cannot happen to Jesus should not happen to you. That's what it means. You and Christ has become one. That is why Jesus will say, you would lay hands on the sick and they will recover. He didn't even say pray. He said lay hands and they will recover. Meaning that your hands has become the hands of Jesus. Your eyes has become the eyes of Jesus. Because why? You and Jesus has become one. And it, Jesus told the Mary and Martha, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Meaning that nothing dies with Jesus. That means nothing should die in your hand. Your business cannot go down. With this understanding is, what you act, is how you activate the power of the resurrection. Go to the next slide. Because I'll be ending with this. The next, next, next. How to access the resurrection power of Christ? Number one, I said believe in and receive Jesus who is the resurrection and life. How do I exercise this power? 
Do you know the power it is for to raise up someone that was dead for three days? The power. The Bible says, for the power that walketh in Christ, in raising him up. Ephesians 1. You don't have to turn there. Ephesians 1. You can verse 18 to 19 and 3, 20 to 22. It says, the power at work that raised Jesus from the dead. He, he, he took, he took the, the whole ammunition of heaven to raise Jesus from the dead. So, believing in Jesus activates the power of resurrection in you. Verse number 2, sorry. Having an understanding of this revelation. See, what produces result in your life is not only quoting scripture, but you must understand the scripture that you are quoting. You must understand the scripture that you are quoting. Because faith, the Bible says faith comes by what? Hearing. And hearing by the word of the Lord. So when we have faith, when we, when we say we have faith, it's because of the understanding we have in Christ Jesus or in God's word. Faith is a result of your understanding of the word of God. So how I access the resurrection power of Christ is by understanding what the resurrection gave to me, gave to you and I. By resurrection, we are now come to we have come together in oneness with Christ. So anything I do is what Christ is doing. If that is the understanding, you will release the power of the resurrection and life. So I am conscious. See, because everything is about consciousness. I we did in our life group, we did an example. We took a, a can of water and peeled the the what do you call it, the label from it. And if I said if it's water in it. But I went inside and put water. But if I come out and I label it poison and give it to you, will you drink it? No. Because why? You are not conscious of what is written there. Even though it is water and I hold it and it says, rah, bah, 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 take, you will not still drink it. Because why? You are co your consciousness has been affected by what you are seeing. It was a can of water. I went inside. I just, I just did it for a few minutes. I came back. I've labeled it poison. I put the word poison on the label and I gave it to you. By seeing that thing, something has affected your consciousness. Though it is water, but you will not drink it. Even if I taste it, you will say, wait, let's wait for one hour. Because why? You still, you still are being affected or controlled by the consciousness of what poison can do to a man. So, when you are conscious of the fact that the resurrection power, or what the resurrection power of God can do, that it can bring dead things back to life, it can change a dead situation. A situation that looks, looks ugly, it can change it. When you are conscious of this, this is how the power of God is activated. Through consciousness. Look at Jesus, sir. They told Jesus that, some, let's go to the house of one of your rulers or leaders. The daughter is dead. Jesus said, no, he's sleeping. Consciousness. They were conscious of death. But Jesus said sleeping. Jesus, Jesus' mind or his consciousness was not, was not affected by the things around him. There was a storm. Jesus saw it as a good time to rest. Someone, someone, Lazarus has died. He says, no, my friend is sleeping. And waited extra four days to prove that he was sleeping and he wanted him to rest. Maybe Lazarus was a busy man. <laughs> So how do you, what, what, what is your consciousness about life? What's your consciousness about God? It's the Bible that says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Not so he will be, so is he. So you release, you affect your situations, you affect your life by the way you think. So if you don't understand the resurrection power of God, what Christ did for you, there are many things that... There, I always say this, that the greatest battlefield of the devil is where? The mind. The mind. When I was very little, in our house, we have a compound. So, my dad would tell me, uh, go outside to the car and bring something for me. Because outside is very dark. Immediately I open the car, I will run. Oh, quickly open the car and bring it in and run back into the house. The reason I was doing that is because I was afraid of the dark. I always think that there is something in the dark that wants to cry and catch me. So that fear will always make me run, quickly open the car, do this. I'm looking at my back look, in case something is coming. Fear. There's nothing, but immediately they bring the light. There's just this calmness that just comes. In fact, I start strolling. Because now, my eyes are open. I can see. So, 
the presence of fear, the presence of certain worries and doubt and anxiety, depression in our life is that there is something that is telling you what you should not believe. Something is speaking to you and you are believing it. The Bible says, for God has not given us the spirit of what? Fear. If I, if I hold this thing, I said, I'm giving it to pastor. Pastor can I reject it and say, no, I don't want. What do I do with it? I take it back. So when he says, God has not given you the spirit of fear, means that who is giving you the fear and you're accepting it? That means you're accepting a gift that is not from God. God has not given you the spirit of fear. That means I'm receiving a gift that is not from God. He says, but he has given us the spirit of love, of power, and of a sound mind. Having an understanding of what God did for us. And lastly, how do I access the power of resurrection? By being a witness of the resurrected Christ. I must be willing to be a witness, be an extension of God. Jesus now is seated with the Father in heaven. But the Bible says in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, it says that you should, you should, and you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead that God sends into you to be able to activate that power and do the work that God has sent you to do. So Jesus expects every one of us, we have received the life of Jesus, right? And as we have received that life, we are supposed to be an extension of what Jesus did. Meaning that we're supposed to continue from where Jesus stopped. So in every street, every homes, every towns, every state, every country, we're supposed to have Jesus is there. Jesus in Mali, Jesus everywhere. Because why? We are now witnesses of him. He says you shall receive power and you shall be witnesses of me. So that's why I don't have to start running to drag somebody. Somebody's by my house and he's feeling sick or feeling down. Someone by the roadside and he's, 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 he needs help. He needs the love of God to be shown there. I don't have to wait for Jesus to fly again and become a man and grow and die before he come and help that person. No. I am now what? A witness. We are now witnesses of Christ. We are now the extension of Jesus. So God can look at the street of Bukit Berwan and says, I, 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 can, I can go and sleep. I have somebody there. I can go and sleep. I have people there. I can go and sleep. I have Hope Melaka there. Because why? We are now witnesses of Christ. The reason we've not seen revival, the reason we've not seen the power of God move in our cities, in our towns, is because people have decided to, to, to just hold the power that God has given to them and keep it in their house. We need to go out there. That any time we walk on the street and minister and talk to people, they feel the presence of God. They know that God can touch them through us. One of the things I, I, I hate the most is demonic oppression. That's when someone is, no matter how they look like, no matter, it, because demonic oppression can come in sickness, disease. You can see someone's life and you just know that this is the hand of the devil at work. I've known somebody that they had about nine siblings. First one died, second one died, third one died, fourth one died, fifth one died, sixth one died, remaining two out of nine. This is not the will of God for them. You can't say that's the will of God. No. It's not everything that God is trying to use to teach his children a lesson. There are some things that are the works of the devil. And God, you can't, you, you can't, you can't say, why is God looking at me? God has sent each and every one of us there. The most painful thing for me is when I can't be an extension of Jesus to a person. When someone comes with an issue and I don't have a solution. That's, that should be our pain and a burden as Christians. That we have received the, the Holy Spirit. Which, it was the Holy Spirit that, that did the resurrection. The Holy Spirit was the power of the resurrection. And when we receive Christ, the Holy Spirit enters into us. And yet, we can't do the works of Jesus. Is it not, is it not an indictment against us when Jesus says, Greater works shall you do. And please, have, yes, you have, most of, we have read the Bible. We see the works Jesus did. Jesus stopped. We need to be challenged sometimes. Challenged. The Bible says we should be challenged to every good work. There was a burial ceremony that was about to happen. And Jesus, Jesus was passing by. He said, what is going on? They are going for a burial. Stop. He touched the, the coffin. And the person woke up. That's the limit Jesus wants us to walk in. We, even though we are not there yet, that's why we strive to be like Jesus. We journey. Is a, perfection is, is journeying onto the perfect man. It's a journey. We walk every day. 
We thank God for the ones that are happening. We see the breakthroughs and the miracles going on in our life. We see the testimonies. But we should not limit ourselves and say, oh, that is all that Jesus can do through us. There is more that Jesus can do. There is more that Jesus can do through you. Don't, we don't wait for pastors and bishops and men of God to do it. I want to be called no title. One of the reasons I even fought that for a PhD because I sat down. I said, because I love the Bible, they'll be calling me pastor. I said, no, I don't like that name. You will call me bishop, prophet. I don't like that name. I was do PhD so that at least there's a doctor. That's the, that, if I t- that's one of the reasons. One of the reasons I want to because I I would love that I have I have a business I'm doing. I'm doing business and I can cast I can heal the sick I can cast out devils. That's what I like. So it's not because so I can tell someone it's not because I'm a pastor I hold the pulpit I have a church that I'm casting no. I want to be able to have, leave an example and say, I can, I can go and teach in a university and somebody's with a crutches. I said, just come. Stop the lecture. Heal the person. Go, go and sit down. No, we don't have to snap it and put it on social media. No. That, do it as your daily life. Do you know what the Bible called healing? It says healing is the children's bread. Almost every day we eat bread. So God is saying that we're supposed to be healing just like the way you eat bread. You and I, that is the goal. That you and I can be as strong as Jesus. Jesus does not want all the glory to himself. Yes, we give him all the glory. But he wants all of us to share in that same power that he has. He took the power, all the power and gave it to you. That's why I said, no, you know, we Africans, we believe that the powers of our village can come to Malaysia without visa. Those witches, those are, they can come to Malaysia without visa and, and affect the life of people here. I've prayed for someone before. I was praying for the person in the night. When I saw the, the, the three of them, they came to come and press me. <laughs> three ugly looking beasts. They, were, they, were, they, were, they are not always fine. I don't know. The devil is not, he uses agents that are not always fine. <laughs> but what I'm saying is here is this that we must have the power of God to be witnesses somebody say witnesses and the way you release that power like I said have an understanding the last one I wrote here faith is the currency of the power of God believe faith most times we want to feel feel something before we act no faith Jesus says go here into the world go go and act the conclusion We must, I would, I would just summarize this because of our time. We're already out of time. Every truth of the word of God must be received by us. These four things I've mentioned, what makes you a Christian? The, the birth, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus is what gives us the power for us to execute ourselves as believers, to live as Christians, and to have the power. I love what I wrote here. I said we are proof of his resurrection. You are looking for the power of his resurrection. You and every, you and you, you, you and your neighbor by your side. You are the proof of his resurrection. We are supposed to be the container of God's power that people come around us, irrespective of their religion, and find the power of God with us. We can be able to dispense, release the life of God to them. Praise Master Jesus. The grave is empty, and Jesus is alive. The grave is what? It's empty. And Jesus is alive. Bow down your heads and talk to God. Can you pray in this moment and say, Lord, make me a witness of your resurrection power. Make me a witness of your resurrection power. Make me a witness. Make me a witness. Make me a witness of your resurrection power. Can we have the Mr. Rola? Yeah. Make me a witness of a resurrection power. Make me a witness. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask, O oh God, that as we go out today, let the power of your resurrection be at work in our lives. That every of our neighbors, our friends, our colleagues will look at us. And, and receive the resurrection and life, they will be able to see Christ and Jesus through our lives in the name of Jesus. That will bring revival to our streets, to our homes, to our friends, to our families in the name of Jesus. 
Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen.